Hello and welcome into the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Mike Shaver, joined by Michael Brunt today. Husker 24-7 member Brian Christofferson. It's got a bit of a scratchy voice, so we're keeping him keeping him on the bench uh today. So that way he can join us, hopefully, for the hype cast later this week. Brunt, we'll start with this. Did the did the plane have a flat tire on either part of the, the trip this weekend? Uh, no, we, we were late getting there. Coming back was perfect. I was home on Sunday by 10 30. So it's an amazing feeling when you, after an away game and you're back before noon happens like once every couple of years. I remember it fondly when I used to travel. It was great. Yes. So it was, it was fine. No flat tires as far as I know. Um, yeah, we, uh, yeah, no, no, nothing remarkable about the travel in that one. Although, we ended up in a place in Cincinnati. BC found this off the road restaurant bar situation where it was a formal former funeral parlor that basically had been turned into a restaurant bar brewery thing. It was like uh, like you're drinking in somebody's living room. It was pretty great. Mm. So but, it, it, this wasn't the Pete Rose place that you went to. That that was the Pete Rose place. There's Pete oh, Rose wow. stuff everywhere. Um, but it, that that was the saving grace of Cincinnati. All right, all right, understandable. Uh, all right, let's dive into what Matt Rule had to say. Nebraska obviously lost Saturday, twenty-one seventeen. Uh, Matt Rule went over a bunch of things on Monday. Give me your biggest takeaway from what Matt Rule had to say. Mm-hmm. We're recording this here Tuesday morning. We haven't heard from the coordinators yet, so we won't have uh, all of the commentary from that. But what did, what did Matt Rule have to say that that stood out to you Monday, uh, listening to him? Yeah, I mean, I mean the the big one, and it was like a five minute answer. Was the uh, the compliment sandwich for the Big Ten officiating? Um, you know, something they something they do well. Being an official is difficult. Um, they blew several calls. That's that's the middle the the meat of the sandwich. And then, uh, you know, it's it's kind of tough being an official nowadays. That that, that was the. Uh, the the compliment sandwich. I I appreciated his ability to kind of turn the knife a little bit while also doing so with a smile. He also mentioned that I thought was interesting that there were three situations last year where Nebraska was told that the review process got the call wrong. Like you took a look at it, still got it wrong. And, you know, the, the, the Big Ten acknowledged the miss of the Emmett Johnson spot because, I, I mean, they were two yards off on that one. But you could have just made a list of 10 things in that game for both teams, by the way, where spots were just completely wrong, um, you know, really kind of questionable ticky-tack calls both ways, missed false starts. Like it was, you know, we, we were talking about this before we started. I mean, it's you, you, you send out this kind of, nothing burger statement a couple days later and it's like okay well thanks like appreciate you backing into my car and appreciate the note but no number so thanks um, yeah i mean what is bill carollo gonna do to make sure this doesn't happen more often also how is your review process where everyone is supposed to have a, a guy whose job it is to make sure hey that doesn't look right i got a buzz in what was, was he on a coffee break was he just not, you know, because you could see like clearly, obviously the benefit of television, but they have monitors, they have screens, they know what the situation is. Uh, where was that guy? And is he without a job today? Like what, you know, like, I don't, I don't need people fired seriously, but it's, it's dumbfounding to me that you put out a statement that basically says, Hey, we got it wrong. Shucks. Well, you get, not okay. only that, but you got like, how it did wrong. Things get better? All of the guardrails that are supposed to keep you yeah. from getting that wrong, you, you just blew right through them. Or the guardrails were like moved. <laughs> like I that's the thing, is it's like I appreciate review, but I mean, if you're not gonna use it, then what 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 are we doing? What what is all this for? Right. Well, I mean, that's always a good question to ask. What is all of this for? <laughs> uh and that doesn't even like here's part of it to me. Some of it is 
Nebraska is not getting the benefit of judgment calls. And that's sort of been the case since they've entered the conference and you can take up your conspiracy or, or what have you as a listener. Um, I don't know that it's just, they're not making calls because it's Nebraska, but I also don't understand how you're watching a player just get wrestled by the neck. You're standing there. Like you're, there is no excuse that you can't see it because it's happening right in front of your face. You're the white hat official standing right there and no flag comes out at any point for that. And that was just one of the, the many calls. And yet we can spot, and it was, uh, there's Bullock. a Twitter user who got very, very upset because he felt like the call was on Fedoni, even though the official stats and the broadcast said it was Alex Bullock. I don't know. Was it Fedoni or Bullock? Can you, can you I confirm this one? I yeah. didn't see it. It doesn't really matter. But somehow you're able to spot that someone wasn't set for a full beat, yet you can't find a holding call when Jamari Butler is being wrestled down by the neck or Isaiah Nair, who I don't think in real time, it didn't, to me, I don't think he caught that pass. Like I, I was okay that that got reversed. I'm probably one of the few. And yet, but no one's able to just see that as he's about to go up for the ball, he's just being grabbed in the center of the chest. Mm -hmm. Or Ja'Cory Barney is just being held across the field while his jersey's being extended like a stretch Armstrong on a play. Like, how are these things being missed, but you can see Alex Bullock wasn't completely set? Like, I, it doesn't make sense. Like, it's the, the application of how things are called is mind-blowing to me in college football. And unfortunately for Nebraska fans, it feels like more often than not, you're on the wrong side of just about everything. And even when there's a system set up in place to review things, you have a head coach that says the Big Ten told them that there was three calls that were incorrectly applied last year. And, oh, by the way, you didn't get to have a real two-minute drive because they took 30-some seconds of your clock away and sent you into disarray. The saving grace of all of that is you discovered you had a kicker who could set the school record for an away game distance kick of 54 yards. John Hole. John Hole. So I guess everything, you know, Nebraska probably wasn't scoring a touchdown on that drive, but these things can't happen. And you shouldn't just get empty rhetoric statements after they do happen. And it's sort of an embarrassing look for the conference, but they don't really care. And I guess that's kind of the frustrating part is as someone who, you know, both covers it and consumes it. If they have no interest in getting better or doing better, like what, why? I don't know who is okay with that. I I have no doubt that it's probably more difficult than ever to be an official with like all of yeah. the all of the scrutiny and whatnot. But at the same time, like you said, off air, and it's a I think it's a it's a really important piece of this. Like if you're talking about billion dollar television contracts and you're gonna start playing start paying athletes tens of millions of dollars a year across the across the school. And then show up and have just mind-blowingly bad officiating. Like you, you got to get that dialed in. Like you know, it, it, it's there's too much at stake now for stuff like that to be happening, or the the things in place to make sure that it doesn't happen from failing. Like you, you got to figure out a way to do that right. What and is, I, oh, go ahead. I was to say, I, I I thought it was noteworthy that. Uh, Nebraska's athletic director, Troy Dannon, was in the room when Matt Rule was talking yesterday. Um, and he wasn't just there for the free pizza. Like, he was there, to, I think, to kind of... Do you mention, know that? Did you did you ask him if he was well, he, enjoying a nice slice of pizza? He, I saw him have a nice slice of pizza, but he was <laughs> he was... A topic of conversation was the officiating, and he being a former official, I think it's something that he's very... Uh, tuned into and I think also kind of going to the mattresses for Nebraska as much as he can behind the scenes to, to make sure the stuff like that is, is not just kind of brushed aside and met with a shoulder shrug from the league office. Yeah. Well, it's, you mentioned the television contracts and that's, that's a big part of this too. The technology is there. So you don't have to make these mistakes. Like that's the infuriating part of it. Yeah. But, the the big one that they're talking about on Saturday, that mistake never should have happened. But also, the ball for Jalen Lloyd never should have been spotted where it was on their fourth and goal. 
But right. someone needs to be able to buzz down and be like, dude, you are a yard off. Like, this is a critical, critical moment in the game. You know, and then there's there's also moments where if you're Matt Rule and you end up taking a timeout on fourth and two to, because you can't get your punting unit in there and why you needed to save five, five yards to punt, you also could have basically just – couldn't you – are they not able to ask for a review in that situation? Because the spot before that one, they were basically a half yard short there because that was the one where Dylan was running and he stretches the ball out and he's just short of the first down to gain. Yeah. You know, like, again, there's just all of these different things happening. And some of it is judgment calls. Like, you're not going to get all the holdings. You're not going to get all of those things. But if you can't even apply the actual rules and the spotting of a football, this isn't watching and laughing as the sideline judge is running up the field, just predicting where the punt went out of bounds. That's kind of what they were doing with everything though. They were just, well, kind yeah, of... but it, it doesn't need to be that way. I know. And then on top of it, if this is happening in a random Nebraska, Ohio state game, you know, it's happening elsewhere in the conference. Are they being graded? What does that look like? How do you get better? How do you make sure that your officiating on the field gets better? Like it's just, the product can't be this bad especially if you're going to be in a big noon kickoff or the, the CBS game of the week or whatever it is, you're just going to televise this ineptitude around the country. Like, there's got to be some level of pride. Like we don't want to look like the idiots that have the worst officiating crew in college football on national television every week. Right. Yeah, no, I know. It, I totally agree. I mean, it's uh well, the, and then the, the level of, I, the level of secrecy about things like a, a, a little bit of transparency, I think would go a long way. Well, I look forward to Bill Carollo giving a complete nothing burger of an answer about this in Indy next year. Yeah. Just like he did about the, I, you remember the Iowa punt return that got called back in the Minnesota game either yeah. last year or two years ago. Yeah. And then he just sort of gives like a complete non-answer and nobody can really, nobody's all worked up. Cause it's like eight months later after the fact. Right. Yep. That's yeah. basically what we're looking at here. The, the next time the Big Ten has to answer on any of this. All right. Uh, besides the officiating, <laughs> what else did Matt Rule have to say? We only spent 12 minutes on that. Yeah. It's going to be a no, short I podcast, mean, and that's going to be half of it. I, I think it's noteworthy. I, Matt Rule had a line in there that, you know, basically, you know, the, as well as Nebraska played against Ohio State and kind of what, what this team is able to take out of that effort. Like his next question is then, you know, well, what happened against Indiana? And I think that's that's probably a little bit of the the root of kind of the mixed feelings, I think, for a lot of people about the way that Ohio State game played is, you know, you can line up and, you know, frankly, kick Ohio State's ass in a lot of a lot of areas in that game on Saturday and then just look like you're playing a completely different sport the week before at Indiana. Um, you know, I, I think. I think that's the challenge that the coaching staff is kind of trying to hammer home over the last last four games of the season is how do you make sure that, you know, you're dialed in. It's more over the Ohio State version of Nebraska and making that Indiana effort kind of a one off. And, you know, we'll, we'll see if they can do it. I mean, I, I, if they play as well as they did against Ohio State, I mean, I, I think they they're going to be right there in all four of those games. But it needs to it needs to show up again and, and that's kind of the challenge and I mean, we can get into the offense a little bit too um he talked screen game was asked about that his answer was they were expecting a really kind of fire off the ball type ohio state pass rush and needed to screen it a little bit but uh probably not in the situations late in the game where where uh, they ended up calling them so you know they I'm eager to, I'm, here's what I'm eager to see. It, it felt like at the end of, in the second half of that game, Nebraska found a little bit in the run game, you know, a little bit of, you know, some, some of the different runs that maybe we haven't seen as frequently. We're hitting a little bit more. They're going to have to find some more of those over the last four games. Um, Cause I don't think they're going to be able to just throw it all over the place when the weather turns terrible, but finding, kind of getting that to travel too, I think would be travel forward would be really important for this offense. I have a question on that because I mean obviously there's a, a lot of talk about Marcus Satterfield saying he wants to to you know commit to to running the football. 
did, did you feel like they committed to running the football against Ohio State? They were they were 50 50 uh, run and pass. I looked at the final. They, split. They've been that almost all year. Like they have not. Been. They you it's know. it's it's not. My issue is not the 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 committing. It's the the when you're committing, because you know after the pick, and you just run like two two Dante Dowdells just right into the middle of the line. Like that felt like a situation where you were probably not going to just power your way in, in, in that, in that case. Um, you know, I, I, I think it just, I, I think you have to pick your spots better. And I think, I don't know that the feel is still quite there yet with what this team is and, and how to, I guess, how to dedicate yourself because I mean, against Indiana, you know, what were seven of the first eight plays or pass plays? Um, it, it's just kind of haphazard. And I, I think that's the frustration for a lot of people is there doesn't seem to be a logic to the way that things are kind of lining up. And I, I think I think against Ohio State, it was kind of the same way where at times it looked OK. At times you, you were able to get guys to the second level, but just not enough. And I, I think that's that's my frustration is it's like it just doesn't the, the spots being picked to dedicate yourself to the run game don't feel right to me. Yeah, I I guess where I sort of took issue with it is that you have this this comment that you want to commit to it. And then there was a couple times on Saturday where you get inside of Ohio State's 40 yard line. You maybe even had like a run that sets it up. And then all of a sudden it's like pass play, lose a couple yards on a screen. Now you're second and 12. So you got to pass. So then it's just three straight passes and you've left yourself with no outs. Like it just, I don't think there's a good feel right now for when to run, how to set up the run. Like it, it, It's, it's kind of like what you said, where the commitment is less of the issue or the total number of rush attempts is less of the issue. And it's more that it doesn't, it feels disjointed in the game flow of what they're trying to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then, like, it can just disappear. And this has been an annoyance, I know, for for people on our message board since the start of of the Matt Rule era. It can just disappear at a moment's notice. Like, you can suddenly seven plays go by and you realize the ball hasn't been handed off to anyone. Right. Um, so it's – there's a I, – I, and I don't know how that necessarily gets better because you either have to kind of force it or, you know, whatever it is. I also – with the screen game answer, I'm jumping around here. With the screen game answer, I get a little bit like, isn't part of it when you're trying to go score when you're playing a team like that? Yes, you're trying to think of what the other team is doing. But if you're only running a screenplay that hasn't worked for you all year mm -hmm. because you think the other team is blitzing, is that putting yourself in a better situation to be successful? Like, it's just a... It just, it feels like, you know, and I, I hate doing this, but it feels like it's too cute by half. Like you're, okay, they're going to do this, so I'm going to do this. Well, I don't do this well, but I'm still going to do it anyways. It it doesn't, it doesn't compute. Like you're just putting yourself in bad spots. And I just, I think this team could be so much better if they avoid even just the simplest stuff of that. Yeah, I think. I think you saw it a little bit more against Ohio State, certainly more than there was against Indiana. But, I mean, you saw a few slants, like a few short yeah. routes over the middle. And I think, I mean, personal preference, I like that a little bit more than, than the short stuff that were running, to the running backs. I mean, I, I think that's – you give Ja'Cory Barney a chance to make a guy miss and get a few more yards or, you know, th those are the kinds of catches that – I feel like Jamal Banks is is kind of made for is kind of the, the stuff over the middle. I mean, they've gotten Thomas Fedoni more involved the last couple of weeks, which I think is, has been good. I think they've gotten him got him involved in better spots too, um, more going forward than side to side. So I'd like to see that a little bit more than the screen stuff. I, I don't I don't get the sense that uh, UCLA is a team you're probably going to have to screen a ton against, but um, you know it, it's. It, I think it's also to the the guys that you're asking to block outside um, needs to be dialed in a little bit more. Like ask the right guys to do it or don't do it. I think that's that's probably the 
what it boils down to for for some fans' frustration with with the side to side passing game right now. Yeah, we'll see what uh, what the coordinator Marcus Satterfield has to say when he talks on Tuesday. Let's talk a little about the defense before we transition away from the Ohio State game. Um, what you know, what kind of stood out to you, Brunts, from from that Saturday's game that you think is something Nebraska can carry with it through the month of November? Like, what is there anything that happened against Ohio State that you are confident? you will see in four games against Nebraska's final four opponents? Defensively? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I, I have a relatively solid level of confidence that the the tackling and effort and, and getting to the ball, I think, will, will travel. It didn't against Indiana, obviously. Um, Illinois was a little bit of a challenge in that area as well. But, I mean, I, I think in some ways the Indiana game was kind of a pretty stark example of, like, what you have to do and the way that you have to play and what happens if you don't play that way. And, you know, I, I think you're going to get to the end of the season or towards the end of the season where you start guys like Ty Robinson and Nash Hutmaker and John Bullock. I mean, those guys really start kind of hearing the, the ticking clock of their college careers. And I think generally guys kind of are able to raise their play to another level. Jamari Butler looked like a completely different player in that game. I mean, the 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 interesting thing to me was, you know, driving back after that game, a lot of the conversation in the Ohio State media was just how terrible they played and how awful they were and this and that. I mean, Nebraska, Ohio State did not run a lot of offensive plays in that game. It was like 46, 47 plays. And – I would say on probably, is it fair to say on like 38 of those plays that Nebraska's defensive line was the better unit than Ohio State's offensive line? Like I, I didn't ever feel like Ohio State asserted itself up front in that game. Yeah, and, I mean, it might even be higher than 38 plays. Yeah. I mean, he might be in the 40s. Yeah, but I mean, it, it was very much the, the conversation was like, oh, man, Ohio State had this terrible game. I'm like, well, I, Nebraska played pretty well defensively, too, I think, aside from four or five big plays. I mean, I, I that that was kind of my takeaway was like, OK, this this defense looks like it belongs on this field in a big way. And I think they're they're going to have to keep scores down. I mean, it, it's going to be phone booth type games on the way into the, the clubhouse in November. But I, I think I think that defense can take it to another level. I really do. And so, I mean, if, if Nebraska is able to beat UCLA, if they're able to beat Wisconsin, it you know, USC is a high-powered offense. I mean, the, the defense is going to have to play really well, and I think they I think they can. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that for sure. Uh, anything else that Rule said that you want to dive into? Uh, Lieben trip is out um injury there so basically you don't have your fullback curious what that kind of looks like in your heavy sets if we're going to see a lot more ty robinson and and all of that um and then kind of continuing on with depth chart stuff you got co-number ones with sierra Wright, tommy hill uh i don't know what it looks like when everybody's healthy i don't know if we're going to get a great view of that until after the bye week um yeah. i would imagine if nebraska has a choice they wouldn't want to play Tommy Hill this week if they don't have to uh, just to give him another week then you get the bye and then you're coming back and if you can get you know three strong games from him that would be ideal and then uh, where was the other change Janiron Bonner Ja'Cory Barney are co-number ones at the slot wide receiver spot any thoughts on any of this front? Uh no I mean I think Barney moving officially to the slot on paper I mean I think that's kind of been expected at in my mind, at least, that that's kind of where things were headed. Um, yeah, the secondary is interesting. Mario Buford was the other. He's on the depth chart now as a true freshman at safety. I thought that was noteworthy. He's traveled. Um, you know, Caleb Benning was on the trip um, at Ohio State. Donovan Jones was on the trip. Braylon Prude was on the trip. Um, you know, a lot of young defensive backs that I think they feel like are, you know, improving on a pretty pretty consistent level. Uh, as, as you get into the season. I, I don't know what the ideal looks like. They mixed and matched guys a lot on uh, Saturday against Ohio State. You had Hartzog played a little corner. 
had some he played some safety. They move move Buford around. I mean, I, I I don't know that there's I don't know that there's like a final lineup that they're really trying to get to. And like this is this is what our five perfect five looks like back there. And I think part of that's just because of the versatility those guys have. Yeah, no doubt about it. Let's discuss a little recruiting here. Nebraska got a big visit weekend coming up against UCLA. They're going to have quite a few players in town. There are quite a few recruits in town. One of those is going to be Florida State commit Chase Lofton, Millard South tight end, uh, having a strong season this year, first year with Millard South having transferred over from Elkhorn North. Brunch, this is the top player in the state that hasn't committed to Nebraska. He came on a visit. I think it was a pretty tight recruitment. He ended up going with Florida State, uh, I think in part because the family had a good relationship with Mike Norvell because he had kind of recruited um, – uh Braden Lofton back when he was at Memphis and I just feel like they they liked what was going on with Florida State flash forward to you know here late October Florida State's one and seven the wheels are starting to come off a little bit there Nebraska's five and three and Thomas Fedoni's coming off of his best two games of the season so far we know the tight end position is something Nebraska wants to utilize more of and Chase Lofton is uh the latest in-state tight end that the the Huskers have an opportunity with. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, I mean, he was always – I mean, he was one of those guys that when he committed to Florida State, you kind of thought like, okay, we'll, we'll see what this maybe looks like in October. Like, Nebraska hasn't stopped recruiting him. Um, I think there's several guys in that 25 class that are kind of along the same lines of like – Nebraska has just kind of been quietly and, and in some cases not so quietly recruiting guys. <laughs> they um, really don't care about your commitment status if they're no. interested. We'll put uh-huh. it that way. There are think, several players that are just yeah. getting full on recruited as if they aren't committed at all. Yeah. I, Dawson Merritt was the one that immediately came to mind. Um, Cortez there. Mills is one for sure too. Yeah. They're, they're not, uh, they're, they're not doing the, Hey, just call us routine. Um, but no, I mean, he's, He's a, a weapon in any offense. And, I mean, you kind of start thinking, okay, you, you've got Chase Lofton who runs a, runs the way he does at the sides. He, he is. The future, you potentially pair that with, like, Carter Nelson, um, you know, and, and some of these other tight ends that, that Nebraska has in their class uh, are, are on their roster already. That's, uh, that's pretty intriguing. And, and I'm curious, do you think there's – like, are are we seeing a Dylan Riola bounce right now? Is is that kind of overblown? Is that pa- are we past that? Like, are people looking at his performance to this point and saying, like, I I want that to to quote Napoleon Dynamite? I mean, I think before the month of October, it looked a lot better than a month where you didn't throw a single touchdown pass. It's it's so I, I, I guess the it's, answer to that is I. I think, yes, he's still a very helpful piece of all of it. I would say some of that momentum has slowed because the offense itself has looked so bad. Yeah, because it's – I guess part of it is, too, is it's like I don't feel like you're kind of getting that, like, counter wave for for a guy that's thrown no touchdowns and five picks in the last couple games, you know? Like, it's – so I don't know. I I could see, though, where if if you're committed to a place that's, you know, one and seven – and you're looking close to home with a quarterback that seems to be have a pretty bright future. I could, I could see the attraction there. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, you know, I think you said the the key thing. It's close to home. Like there, there's a Florida State. I think sounds really, really good when you commit in June, and then you start going through your senior year and your parents aren't going to be able to watch you play as easily. You've got another brother that's playing college football at Kansas state and Florida state isn't playing well. I think, you know, when I first heard last month that there was a real chance that Chase Lofton was kind of looking around um, the first two teams that came to mind were Missouri and, and Nebraska. He hasn't had the same interest in Kansas state uh, where his brother is having success, but uh, those were, were the two that I thought of. And I, I think he'd have been, the strong fit at either of those schools had he chose them instead of Florida State. And I think it could happen pretty quickly for Nebraska with, with Chase Lofton uh, coming to town. I, I want to stick with, with tight end real quickly because Chase Lofton will uh, move on after this year. And then 2026, Isaac Jensen, 
who Brunts, I am telling you, I think is Thomas Fedoni level recruit, uh, mm-hmm. which is kind of what I said about Ben Bramer, who, by the way, is playing very well for Iowa State as well, or has, you know, throughout his career so far. Isaac Jensen just picked up an LSU offer. I think the secret's out. I think a lot of people are going to be offering Isaac Jensen, and I think 24-7 sports will be rating him higher than an 89 when it comes to uh, ultimately the 2026 class. Isaac Jensen's going to be a big deal, and Nebraska has him coming in this weekend as well. Yeah, it's. I, I was just curious as you were talking. I was looking to see who officially visited the last time UCLA played at Nebraska. Oh, um, okay. Give me some there names. Were, there were four visitors. Two were making in-state. Two in-state prospects were making official visits. Twenty thirteen, September fourteenth of twenty thirteen. Okay. One of one is an NFL player, and the other was known for wearing. Uh, cartoon t-shirts so dj foster yes made his official visit for the ucla game so that's what we got do we have luke gifford as an official visitor too for that he was he was the other okay and so then the uh, NFL player. then we then we have uh he ended up signing with virginia tech ricky walker a defensive tackle yeah. and uh brandon powell vaguely. brandon powell Florida athlete who ended up uh, signing with Florida and ended up with uh, ended up in the NFL with the Lions. Okay. I was going to say, there's a Brandon Powell that plays for the Vikings. I'd be fascinated if that was the same Brandon Powell. This is a wide receiver. Yeah. Also yeah. a wide receiver. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. we. Uh, you know what is amazing to me? What's that? When I first started, basically, like, you'd have all of these game day official visitors, and now we're probably going to go, like, the entire season where maybe one or two people use an official visit during the season. Like, the recruiting calendar is so different now. So, so very different. And it's going to get We're five weeks from different. signing day. I, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't, you know? didn't mean to. Jeez. Did cry about it. Jeez. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Brandon Powell uh, of, of the Vikings, Lions, Falcons, Bills, Dolphins, Rams, and currently of the Vikings. <laughs> yeah, he's bounced around a little bit. Yeah. He's like their fourth string wide receiver. Yep. So, uh, okay. Well, that's, that's some exciting stuff. Elsewhere, recruiting wise, I mean, again, Nebraska really focused on trying to get this 2025 class uh, finished up here. We mentioned it in the past. We mentioned it here on this podcast too. It doesn't matter if you're committed somewhere. And that, I mean, we we said Cortez Mills, the other wide receiver. I mean, Corey Sims is still hearing a lot from Nebraska. He's committed to USC, uh, but he's hearing a lot from Nebraska. And then the other side of things, Malcolm Simpson and Jeremiah Jones, uh, two guys that are hearing from other programs as well. If Chase Lofton ends up flipping to Nebraska, that opens up a tight end spot for Florida State to go very hard at Jeremiah Jones. I don't know if he wants to play tight end. And I think the one and seven start makes it a little bit harder, but that is a guy that I believe is going to be tough for Nebraska to finish with in their class. Like I, I think that one's going to be difficult. Malcolm Simpson really likes Nebraska. I don't know if he's going to stay in the class either. Like I would, I would say it's almost 50, 50 on both of those guys at this point in time. So there's a lot going on uh, recruiting wise here at the moment with, with Nebraska as well on another big visit weekend. A lot of 26s and 27s, I'm guessing, coming in for the UCLA game. With gets the 230 start, so you get some regional guys that are able to make it in easily enough. So that's always uh, a little bit convenient as well. All right, Brunson, anything else you'd like to get to before we shut down here today? Uh no, I'm good. We got the we got the hype cast this week. I'm excited to uh to get hyped for that. You're you're excited to get there. Was people who were wondering if we were really hyped last week leading into that Ohio State. We should have been. We should have been. Shame on I'm us. I'm always hyped for college football. My my yeah, argument to that is you only, especially right now with the trend Nebraska's on, you're only guaranteed 12 games. You know that's not that many. You yeah. you gotta you gotta enjoy it when you can. And you know Saturday was more enjoyable than not enjoyable. I was and this Saturday the- could be more enjoyable and could get you a 13th game. 
It's true. Send brunch to Detroit, many are saying. That's that's what the people want. Um, I was I was thinking with Thursday being Halloween, I'm not sure if a costume version of the uh the hype cast is in order. I was I was seriously considering ordering a macho man Randy Savage get up, not mm. telling you guys, and then just showing up on the hype cast with it and just seeing what happened. The cream of the crop. <laughs> if you would have referenced if you would have been like Big Ten President Jack Tunney, <laughs> I would have <laughs> lost it. Like completely and utterly lost it. I, I got, have watched Amazon way too many here. Macho Man. I, I've watched way too many Macho Man promos. Yeah. It, it would have been fantastic. I would have I would have enjoyed it. You think you can get your voice that gravelly? No. BC probably could. He's he's got uh <laughs> he's got some issues right now. Uh, I'm guessing BC was where I was in September. Yep, 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 yep. So you're just you're gonna be the last one standing here. It's gonna just cover cross. yourself in bubble wrap and yeah, breathe through a straw to open air. So, all right, we are mercifully going to finish this podcast now, and but it. we will tell you. <laughs> we will tell you to join us at husker247.com for more. Great conversations about Macho Man Randy Savage, Big Ten officiating, and screen games. You can find all of that at Husker247.com. We appreciate you watching, listening, wherever you do. Please like and subscribe and join us at Husker247. We'll be back later this week with a Husker247 hypecast.